The state of Maine has some of the best and most diverse natural beauty of any state. The mountains, the rivers, the coast, and the forests all blend together into offering majestic scenic views to the residents and visitors of the state. Interestingly, this beauty changes with the seasons, offering people a year-round splendor. To capitalize on this beauty, the Maine Department of Transportation has created what it calls scenic byways. These follow designated highways in different parts of the state. Each of these byways has some unique natural beauty to offer. In Arista County, there are two byways. The first is the Fish River Byway. This 37-mile stretch of road follows Route 11 from Portage to Fort Kent. The Fish River Byway offers scenic views of lakes, rivers, forested areas, wildlife, and even Maine's most famous Mount Katahdin. The second is the newly designated St. John Valley Cultural Scenic Byway. This 92-mile stretch of road starts in the town of Allagash and ends in Hamlin, just outside of Van Buren. Work on this byway started in 2012 and was completed in July 2014. This byway was designed not only to showcase the natural beauty of the area, but to highlight the rich cultural diversity, especially that of the French and Acadians that live in the St. John Valley. To tell the story of the Valley's cultural traditions, the Maine Department of Transportation commissioned three people to explore, develop, and tell the Valley's story using interpretive panels. For those not familiar with interpretive panels, these are permanent signs that use pictures and words to describe and tell a story. In the St. John Valley Cultural Byway, a total of 31 such panels have been installed in 12 different locations. This film shows the locations of these panels as well as the topics covered on each panel. After seeing all the panels, one has an understanding of the history, the beauty, the economy, and the unique culture of the St. John Valley, both in the past and the present. The first stop is in the town of Allagash. There are two panels in Allagash. Both are found on the grounds of the Allagash Historical Society, which is located on the banks of the St. John River. In 1838, several families of Scott, English, and Irish origins left the Campbellton, New Brunswick area, seeking a new place to call home. They followed the St. John River, poling past the French settlers already established in the Madawaska Territory in St. David. They chose to settle the sparsely populated area along the Allagash and St. John Rivers. Living in the midst of such natural beauty of hills and rivers, covered with virgin forests of spruce, fir, and pine, they made use of the natural resources to create a viable and thriving community they now call Allagash. The people affectionately call themselves Moose Towners to indicate a deep down personal connection to the rivers and hills. This reference still exists today and expresses a heartfelt pride of strong-willed, hard-working and caring people who love music, humor and share close family ties. Allagash is home. Logging was, and still is, the most important economic part of Allagash. However, the forest and logging have changed over time. Initially, the forest provided huge white pine logs, which were used for the shipbuilding industry. The forest then provided cedar and hardwood logs for houses. Today, the forest continues to provide lumber for homes, but also the raw materials for the pulp and paper industry. The logging methods have also changed over time. Initially, horses, long saws, buck saws, and peavies made up the tools used for harvesting trees. Mechanical chainsaws then replaced hand saws, and skidders replaced horses. Today, computerized harvesters, skidders, and feller bunchers have replaced chainsaws. One unique feature of lumbering was the annual river log drive. 
Logs that had been cut during the winter were piled on the shores of the rivers. During the high spring water, the logs were floated down the river to market. However, in 1964, river drives were replaced by railroads and trucks to bring the logs to market. The next stop is in the town of St. Francis. There is one panel on the grounds of the St. Francis Historical Society. In 1910, St. Francis became the last stop on the Bangor and Aroostook Railroad. The railroad had now opened access to the outside world to a previously isolated community. Passenger and freight trains ran twice a day. Much of what was for sale in Wally Albert's grocery store came in by rail. The railroad also carried logs, pulpwood, and potatoes to market. The railroad became especially important once the river log drives ended in 1964 by providing a means of transportation for bringing forest products to market. A unique feature of the railroad in St. Francis was the turntable. Railroad locomotives have great pulling power when moving forward. However, when traveling in reverse, they have limited power. Because the railroad ended in St. Francis, there was a need to turn the locomotive around. A turntable was built. This allowed the locomotive to drive onto a circular platform and be spun around so that it could travel again in a forward direction. The turntable was used until the rail line was closed in the 1980s. The panel tour now continues to the town of St. John. At the St. John Community Center, the panel is devoted to the system of boundary markers between the United States and Canada. In 1783, the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Revolutionary War, was unclear about Maine's border with Canada. The treaty referred to the Highlands to mark the border between northern Maine and Canada. However, there were two sets of Highlands, one along the St. Lawrence and one at the southern end of what is now Rustic County. In 1842, the Webster-Ashburton Treaty settled a boundary dispute and established the current boundary along part of the St. John River. To identify the boundary line, a system of over 8,000 markers made of steel and concrete are in place along the 5,500-mile border between the United States and Canada. Such markers can be found along the St. John River Valley. One such marker is located along the road in front of the St. John Community Center. In Fort Kent, the panels are in four separate locations. The first Fort Kent panel is located at the Historical Society's train station. The most important economic growth factor to happen in Fort Kent was the arrival of the railroad in 1902. Prior to this, selling crops, especially potatoes, was limited to the local area. The railroad changed all of this. Now the potato crop could be efficiently transported to markets in the south. Potato production in Fort Kent increased dramatically. The railroad also provided passenger service. People could now take the train and visit family in Bangor and beyond. The railroad also provided good employment, especially with snow removal in winter. Everyone wanted to work on the railroad, since it was the highest paying job around. Although passenger train service ended in the 1950s, the railroad continues to be an important mode of transportation for shipping forest products to market. The second Fort Kent panel is located next to the new mural on the corner of the street to Riverside Park. Crossing the border was once like crossing the street. The border was not a barrier. People crossed the border to do the simplest daily life's activities, such as shopping, attending church, and dating. It is still common for many valley families to have parents that come from both sides of the river. Crossing the border has changed over time. 
Before bridges, there were ferry boats crossing all along the St. John River from Allagash to Van Buren. Fort Kent actually had two ferry boat crossings. In addition, in 1905, a footbridge had been built to join Fort Kent and Clare. The Fort Kent ferry boats and footbridge were discontinued when a steel bridge was built in the 1930s. Crossing the border still remained easy, that is, until September 11, 2001. World politics took over and national security became a major issue. The border, which had been easily crossed, now became a barrier of electronic surveillance equipments, armed border guards, and requiring official documents to cross. The third Fort Kent panel is located at the Mile One marker next to the International Bridge. The history of the St. John Valley is really the story of one people that was divided into two countries. When the first Acadian settlers arrived in St. David in 1785, there was no border. They settled on both sides of the river, and not the Canadian side or the American side. The river was a road for travel, and not one to divide families. It was not until the webster ash Britain Treaty in 1842 did the river become a border. Today, despite the strict border crossing regulations, it is still the story of one people. The language of business may be different on both sides, that is, French on the Canadian side and English on the American side, but it is still one people. Family names such as Daigle, Sear, and Peltier exist on both sides of the river. Ploys are a traditional food on both sides of the river. The last of the Fort Kent panels is located in front of the Acadian Archives on the campus of the University of Maine at Fort Kent. This panel is different from the others in that it is much larger and contains four separate panels. Who is a Maine Acadian? This is a common question asked in the St. John Valley, especially during the 2014 World Acadian Congress. Although we associate being Acadian with the people that were resettled by the deportation in Nova Scotia in 1755, there are many more Acadians. The Acadians are descendants of the French who came to the New World in the 1600s and made Lacadie their home. Lacadie included the area which is now Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island. Acadians come predominantly from French and Catholic backgrounds. Acadians are known for their hard work ethics, as well as their spirit of volunteerism. Acadians are also known for their large, close-knit families. They share a French language that has its origins in 17th century France. The language oftentimes includes Quebecois expressions and English words. They also share the same oral stories, legends, superstitions, natural medicines, and foods. Their traditional arts include knitting, making woven and braided rugs, storytelling, singing, fiddling, and dancing. Are you Acadian? The second panel is a welcome sign from the Maine Department of Transportation. It features a detailed map of the American side of the St. John Valley. The map also includes the locations of each interpretive panel throughout the valley. The third panel shows the Acadian deportation, also known as Le Grand Dérangement, that happened in 1755. When the settlers from France arrived in Nova Scotia in 1604, many established themselves in the Bay of Fundy area. This area was under British control. Since the settlers were mostly farmers and fishermen, they quickly developed the land into thriving farms. However, by the 1700s, the British wanted this land for the English farmers from New England. In 1755, the British started a systematic expulsion of the French farmers from their land. The people were loaded onto British ships and returned to France, 
or dropped off in different locations all along the east coast of the United States, the Caribbean islands, and even South America. Between 1755 and 1762, more than 7,000 Acadians were deported from Nova Scotia. In 1785, some of these deported Acadians arrived in St. David and settled along the shores of the St. John Valley. The last panel is a description of the Acadian archives at the University of Maine at Fort Kent. The archives documents preserves, and provides information about the peoples in the St. John and Allagash River Valleys. On-site assistance is available in the areas of regional history, genealogy, folklore, and folk life. In addition to preserving links to the past, the archives seeks to celebrate and sustain Acadian culture for the future. Our next stop on the Byways Panel Tour is in the town of St. Agatha. There are panels in two separate locations. The first St. Agatha panel can be seen next to the gazebo in the town park. In the late 1800s, several Valley Catholic priests recruited sisters from different religious orders to teach in the local public schools. One such order was the Daughters of Wisdom. In 1904, the daughters were invited to come to St. Agatha to teach. After arriving, they built a convent, a boarding school, a home for the elderly, but primarily they were involved in educating St. John Valley students. The education that the students that attended the boarding school received was unique. Not only did the students receive schooling in the subjects of English, math, and history, but also in the classical subjects of music, art, and French. A second track of education, called commercial, was offered and included office skills and typing. The Daughters of Wisdom will always be remembered as enhancing education in the St. John Valley. The second St. Agatha panel is located on the grounds of the Historical Society. What is now considered arts and crafts were once essential household skills. Knitting, weaving, and quilting were all talents needed in the early homes and farms. People did these skills out of necessity to keep their families warm and clothed. There was no money to buy clothes, but there were sheep on the farm that could be sheared in the spring to make the wool yarn for mittens and sweaters. Women were especially clever at what we now call recycling. Worn and used clothing was cut up and used to make rugs for the wooden floors, dishcloths, or quilts. Nothing was wasted. Today, these same traditional crafts are still practiced in the St. John Valley, but more for art rather than functional necessity. Our next stop is in the town of Frenchville. There is nothing more iconic in the valley's history than the Frenchville water tower. It was originally built to hold 50,000 gallons of water for the steam locomotives that service the passenger and freight transportation needs of the valley. The water tower later served as a reservoir for the town's fire department. And today, it serves as a reminder of the past. At the site of the water tower, there are three panels. Growing potatoes has been the main economic agricultural crop in the St. John Valley ever since the first settlers arrived. The rich sandy soil, especially along the riverbanks, was very suitable for growing potatoes. At first, the small family farms grew potatoes for their personal consumption. As production grew, the farms sold excess potatoes to other new farmers or to logging camps. But potato farming really exploded when the railroad came to the valley in 1902. The railroad provided a way of shipping potatoes to the populated areas in southern Maine and beyond. In addition to growing potatoes, 
Farmers grew other crops, such as oats and buckwheat. The oats were sold as animal feed, especially for the horses in the lumber camps. Buckwheat was grown and ground into flour to make joys. Today, potato farming has become mechanized and specialized. Tractors have replaced horses. Harvesters have replaced the armies of hand pickers. Farmers are now growing specialized potato varieties to meet the specific market products, such as potato chips and french fries. Smuggling has always been one of those accepted activities in the St. John Valley. Prior to the Boundary Settlement in 1842, crossing articles across the river was not smuggling, but rather a normal everyday activity. However, on the day in 1842 that the St. John River became the boundary, crossing articles became a punishable crime. However, the establishment of the boundary did little to stop the crossing of articles. The most common articles crossed included butter, molasses, sugar, and even farm animals. But in 1920, and the passage of a federal law prohibiting the consumption of alcohol in the United States, the illegal importation of liquor into the U.S. became a money-making activity. The stories of smuggling by Gus across the St. John River became renowned. Two local smugglers, Maxime Albert and Fred Levesque, became famous legends. Potatoes were, and continue to be, the biggest agricultural cash crop in the St. John Valley. Potatoes are harvested in the fall and stored for shipping at a later date. Storing potatoes in the winter months has undergone many changes. Initially, when farmers raised potatoes for themselves or for local sale, potatoes were stored in root cellars under their homes. As production volume increased, farmers built potato houses on the slope of a hill where three sides of the building was underground. But when the railroad arrived, farmers built potato houses along the edge of the railroad tracks for easy shipping of their crops to market. However, beginning in 1968, when Interstate 95 was built all the way to Holton, the use of tractor trailers replaced railroad cars. This also changed how potatoes were stored in the winter. The use of steel buildings that are well insulated and ventilated were now built close to the farms rather than close to the railroad tracks. Our panel tour continues east and arrives at the new boat launch near the Frenchville Madawaska town line. Do you know how the St. John River got its name? In 1604, Samuel Le Champlain, a French explorer and map maker, arrived in North America at what is now known as St. Croix Island, on the easternmost point of the main coast. There he established the first settlement in North America. From there, he continued to explore the area and making maps for future fur traders and settlers. On June 24, 1604, which happened to be the feast day of St. John the Baptist, he arrived at the mouth of the St. John River. He had never seen such a large and deep river. Because this was the feast day of St. John the Baptist, Champlain named the river the St. John. The next panels are in the town of Madawaska. On the outskirts of Madawaska is the Tante Blanche Museum, operated by the Madawaska Historical Society. Here there are five byways panels. The first panel answers the question of why the Acadians settled in the St. John Valley. By 1783, the British were losing American colonies in the south. The British were looking to expand their territory in the St. John, New Brunswick area. As the British settlers, who were Protestant, reached St. John, the existing French and Acadian settlers, who were Catholic, felt unwanted and trapped. 
the French started to look towards the sparsely populated area in the northern reaches of the St. John River to relocate. The French and Acadians then sold their land in St. John and traveled up the St. John River and settled in the St. David area. Aside from the encroachment by the British Protestants in St. John, the French and the Acadian settlers saw the St. David area as free land. This was not only a reference to not having to pay for this land, but a reference to be able to practice their Catholic faith without the Protestant influence. In addition, the St. David area was much closer to French-speaking Quebec, which could provide French-speaking priests. While some Americans proudly trace their roots to the Mayflower, valley roots lead back to 1785 and the first 17 Acadian families that settled in the St. David area. To celebrate their heritage, valley people organized family reunions using individual family names. Large families over many generations have swollen the number of people with the same family name. The Sear family claims to have over 60,000 descendants. During the recent Sear family reunion, 4,000 Sears attended. The architecture of the early St. John Valley houses was influenced by either French Canadian or Acadian styles. For example, the roof of the Acadian homes was set parallel to the river. The roof of the French Canadian homes was set at right angles to the river. Because the early settlers had to clear the land, there were ample logs for building homes. This solid timber construction of using logs was known as pièce sur pièce. Later, the round logs were square hewn. This made for a snug fit between individual logs, but also provided an opportunity to add some additional materials on the walls to provide more insulation against the winter's cold weather. Porches were also common on the front of valley homes. These not only provided a covering over the front door, but also provided a covered area, especially in the summer, to gather, sit, swing, talk, and enjoy the cool evening air, rather than being inside a hot, poorly insulated house. The third panel describes the creativity and ingenuity of the people in the St. John Valley. Local French people call a person who can make or fix just about anything a patente. A patente is created using a minimum amount of fuss with available tools and materials. The early valley settlers had an abundance of wood as a result of clearing land. Wood was ideal for making a variety of patents. Plows to till the farmland were made out of wood. Tools for carding wool. Molds for shaping butter. Kitchen utensils and a variety of farm implements were ingeniously carved and shaped from wood. This panel shows examples of local people who have demonstrated the talent of being patenteux. Aurel Collin a renowned woodcarver, made his tools from old straight shaving razors. Blackie Sear, another woodcarver, made crooked knives from scrap pieces of metal and used these to do his wood carvings. Norman Sear, who had studied welding, used this skill to patent whatever his neighbors asked for, from snow plows to staircases. The first Acadians arrived in the St. John Valley in 1785. They had traveled up the St. John River and found some good fertile soil to establish farms in St. David. Five years later, in 1790, the population in this Madawaska settlement had increased to 174, most of which were Acadians and a few French Canadians. Among these were Marguerite Blanche Thibodeau, better known as Tante Blanche. She took a special interest in helping others in the settlement. She attended the sick, and she provided for those in need. In 1795, extremely harsh weather hit the Madawaska Territory. For two years, there were early frosts, river flooding, and harsh winters. By 1797, the food supply in the settlement was very low. That winter, the men took off to the woods to hunt. While they were away, 
A terrible snowstorm began and lasted for eight days. The women and children in the settlement were alone with no food. Tante Blanche strapped on her snowshoes and traveled through the deep snow from house to house distributing provisions to snow-trapped families. Our panel tour now reaches the town of Grand Isle. On the Madawaska Grand Isle town line is the Mount Carmel rest stop. Here we find one of the byways panels. One of the main reasons the Acadians had left St. John, New Brunswick to resettle in St. David was to practice their Catholic faith. St. David was much closer to Quebec, and the Madawaska settlers hoped to attract priests from Quebec. In just two years after the Acadians had arrived in 1785, they had built a chapel and had joined the Diocese of Quebec. However, after the webster ash Treaty in 1842 set the boundary with Canada as the St. John River, the Acadian settlers on the American side wanted to show their allegiance to the United States. Although they were pleased with the Diocese of Quebec, the settlers wanted to show that they were part of the United States. As a sign to show allegiance, they petitioned the Diocese of Boston to join them rather than the Diocese of Quebec. Their request was approved. In the town of Van Buren, there are panels in three separate locations. The first three panels are found on the grounds of the Acadian village. The first panel examines how the first family settlers separated their new land. Each family was to have a strip of land that started at the river. The strip would continue in a perpendicular direction to the top of the valley hills. This same system of dividing property had also been used along the St. Lawrence River. This system made it fair to all families. Each had access to the river. Each had some rich, fertile riverbank soil. Each could clear the hillside to make pasture land. And each had access to the maple and beech trees on the top of the hills for firewood. This system of strip land division became known as suspender farms. Note that the St. John Valley is the only area in Maine where the strip system of land surveying is used. The rest of the state was surveyed by a British-inspired invention of square blocks called townships. Each township is a square block, six mile long by six miles wide. The French Acadian families lived on self-sufficient farms. They grew much of what they needed. They also raised chickens for eggs, sheep for wool, a dairy cow, and perhaps a pig. They made their maple syrup and gathered fiddleheads. However, for cash to buy what they did not grow, the men would leave the home to work in the logging camps during the winter. The women were left at home to raise the children and manage the home. The women were in charge of the home. Even after the men returned from the woods in the spring, the women continued their leadership and authority role in the home. Today, the women still remain in charge of the French Acadian homes. Listen carefully to children who ask something of their parents. The usual answer is, demande à ta mère. In English, the answer is, ask your mother. Large families of a dozen kids or more were common in French Acadian culture. Having children not only provided workers on self-sufficient farms, but it was also a recognized fact that there was strength in numbers. Everyone in the family worked on the farm or in the home. By the age of 10, children were expected to pull their own weight. Each child had their own chores. Everyone contributed to the good of the household. It is no wonder that the French Acadian families were a close-knit group with strong family bonds. In front of St. Bruno's Church is a panel which describes all the churches in the St. John Valley. Each community in the St. John Valley has at least one church. This shows the close religious ties the valley people had in the past 
and continues to this day. This panel not only includes a photo of all the valley churches, but also a brief overview of each. However, in the center of the panel is an in-depth history of the St. Bruno's Catholic Church. Van Buren's last panel is located in the center of town. The town of Van Buren was the valley's first industrial center. The logs that had been harvested in Allagash and floated down the St. John River during the spring log drives all ended up at a huge sawmill in Keegan. Initially known as the Van Buren Lumber Company, it would eventually become the Hammond Lumber Company. In 1904, this 400-acre mill site produced more than 1 million cedar shingles a week and was one of the largest mills east of the Mississippi. It employed over 400 men and another 1,500 more during the winter operations. This mill would produce more than 100,000 board feet of lumber a day. In 1904, getting all this sawed lumber to market became an issue. The Bangor and Rustic Railroad, which had reached Fort Kent, was still 30 miles away from Van Buren. The mill owners threatened to build their own railroad. By October of that year, the Bangor and Rustic Railroad reached Van Buren, allowing the forest products to be shipped to the southern main markets. Outside of Van Buren, on the road to Caribou, is the town of Sear Plantation. On the grounds of the Governor Brand School is a panel on language and education. The St. John Valley has two main languages, that is French and English. The French language had come from the influx of Acadians and French Canadians from Quebec, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. The English language had come from the influx of British loyalists from the New England colonies. Maine, which had become a state in 1820, had a government that was English. By 1844, Maine law stated that teachers should be capable of teaching the French language. However, in 1919, Maine law was changed to read that the basic language of instruction in all schools shall be English. The use of the French language in school was forbidden. Students were punished for speaking French, not only in the school buildings, but also on the school grounds. However, it was not until 1969 that a law sponsored by Senator Elmer Violet of Van Buren and Representative Emilien Levac of Madawaska repealed the ban. The last panel on this byways tour is located in the town of Hamlin. On the grounds at the Roosevelt School, which had been built in 1933, is a panel on one-room schoolhouses. Educating children in the early St. John Valley was a difficult issue. Although there were schools in the major valley towns, most of the farm families lived outside of town. There was no transportation system to bring the farm children to town schools. But in the early 1930s, the state of Maine built one-room schoolhouses throughout the farming areas of the St. John Valley. These provided education for grades 1 through grade 8. Here children learned the basic subjects of grammar, math, vocabulary, spelling, and geography. Classes ended with the 8th grade. However, girls could go on to high school at the academy that had been opened by the Daughters of Wisdom in St. Agatha. This concludes the tour of the interpretive panels located along the St. John Valley Cultural Scenic Byway. Looking at all these panels collectively, they represent a complete history of the people and cultures that exist in the valley. The panel tell the story of the valley. The main Department of Transportation should be recognized for promoting the St. John Valley as a tourist destination but also presenting the valley as a unique cultural center. The byway panels were made possible by three specific people, Larry Johannesman from the Maine Department of Transportation, 
and Nancy Montgomery and Jack Vreeland from Montgomery Design. These people met with hundreds of Valley people to collect their thoughts, their pictures, their ideas, and their stories about the life in the St. John Valley. Once collected, they synthesized all this information into 31 panels. A special recognition is also given to Jean Lebrun from Rivière Bleu, Québec, for the French translation of all the information on the panels. A final thank you goes out to Fort Kent's WFKT, Channel 4 Television, for producing this Byways Panels Tour.